Hey guys, what's up? This episode uh, was a shoot your shot episode. I came across a webinar hosted by DC History Center. Didn't even know they existed. And anyway, the conversation was about urban renewal. And it had two journalists on there. And I shoot my shot at both of them. And both of them agreed to talk to me. The first journalist, or should I say reporter, is Derek Ward, a general assignment reporter for News 4, a native of D.C. He grew up in Marshall Heights and H Street, Northeast. He lived through the 1968 riots, and he documented his experiences on News 4 as part of the station's 40th anniversary coverage. The one thing I got out of our conversation in terms of how DC is in love with developers. And it all stems back to home rule because DC is not a state, if you haven't already know. And for a long time, DC didn't even have a mayor and Congress controlled everything. And then we got home rule and then we had Mary and Barry And because of Barry, Congress took back some things and there was some control over finances. When Derek mentioned that, it kind of clicked because developers wasn't interested in the city. It wasn't until Anthony Williams and the baseball stadium that came about that developers started to get interested in the city. I I really didn't want to get into race, but... When you have a large amount of black people occupying space, living space, home ownership, the value of the land deteriorates. Like the, So developers were like, why would we want to develop the city if the property values are nothing and would we get our return on investment? So after the stadium was built and all this other activity and people are moving into the city, then developers started to get interested. And then you have today, where it's teetering on half and half of the population between black and whites, and more poor middle-class folks are leaving the city, and more affluent folks are moving into the city. I never thought of it that way, until Derek brought that up, or at least brought the parallels up. So it's a short interview, including this intro, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks. Well, thank you again for doing this in such short notice. I caught your- Not a problem at all. I caught your uh, webinar you did with Sam Smith. Uh Uh-huh. I actually tagged him too, and I have an interview with him on Tuesday or Wednesday of this week. Oh, great. So get two perspectives. A little bit about me. I am a Washington native, born and raised. Uh, I went to School Without Walls for high school. Mm -hmm. I grew up uh, in Tyler House, which is North Capitol and New York Avenue. Right. In that whole urban renewal uh, area. And I'm just investigating where I live. So Mm -hmm. when I saw the webinar, I got super excited. And after I heard it, I got to talk to these gentlemen. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they were so rich in the history. So basically, again, urban renewal, I don't know if you knew about it. I remember the, there was a whole, there was a lot of building going on. One thing, like DC hadn't had new schools built in a long time. I think the new Dunbar, which isn't too far from that area, mm-hmm. uh, was the first new school for that era. Now there, there's been a whole wave. But we, we saw a lot of construction like that, like Tyler House. Uh, there was another project right at the East Capitol and the Central Avenue, right on the DC line, which was sort of that same concept as Tyler House, you know, high rise uh, buildings. And it, it was encouraging to see that because that was an era when high rise meant success and all of that. That was, yeah, we're, we're somebody now, there's a high rise. And the concept is changed a bit. Uh, DC's always been limited by the, the height restrictions and stuff when you're close in anyway. But uh, that was just uh, that when that era ca- area came up, I mean, and how you see the townhouses that are all along New York Avenue, sort of on the other side, and come yeah. right up to where all of that happened. So that's what you had coming all the way out, and it got light industrial as you got closer. 
out of Bladensburg Road. But yeah, it was a wave of tall buildings going up. And again, it, it was encouraging. Being younger then, I didn't realize the deep concept of what was going on, but it was sort of a sense, okay, somebody cares about the city. They are, they're building new stuff. Um, not as mindful then of the displacement that urban renewal brings with it from those communities, the folks who live there already. Moving forward, it's an era where I grew up in. You had Rayful Edmonds and right across the street from Tower House, there was a shooting there and it killed a young teenager. And maybe this isn't the, the, the area or the cluster of low-income people that we wanted. Do you remember that era and what was your take on it during that time? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was a trouble spot. The, the neighborhood where I grew up was uh, right adjacent to a, a project called Eastgate, which was a lot older than Tyler House. But uh, in that 80s, 90s era, it started to calm down a bit in the 90s. Though so that's that's when you saw the the concentration of public housing like that. That seemed to be a problem, and that's sort of when the notion was moving away from that too. Yes, in the late 90s, you had the Williams administration and Kelly before, but they were moving away from that concept of, of having everything clustered like that. They wanted to do mixed use or mixed income uh, housing. And I think those were the examples of that. Although they took kind of a heavy handed approach to it. I think it, it was really just uh, a lot of enforcement and things like that. There were programs that, that I know of, I, mean, I didn't live in that area, but I knew programs that are around and centers that were supposed to sort of be the, the little oases of, of resources and things like that and, and opportunity around there. But again, that was just the realization, I think, in that era that, that when you cluster uh, things together like that, it, it doesn't promote moving out. And it, it sort of traps people, I think, to a certain extent. Right now, mm -hmm. the protest that's happening, how is that different from the protest that happened, what, 30, 40 years ago? Yeah. Something like uh, that? Yeah, I mean, I was really, you know, I remember the, the civil rights movement. I was born in 62, so, you know, it was still going on and it had been up. And, you know, I had recollections of that. And, and you know, uh, this doesn't compare, I think, to anything else that I can remember in, in, in recent times, anytime you had mass protests or anything. I mean, here in D.C., you, you had marches for housing and things like that. That was a lot in the 60s. And again, before I was even involved in, in, in those kind of things. But I don't, I don't think there's a, a strong comparison. I can't really compare mm -hmm. the 60s because of the issues that, that has spawned all of this. It's so immediate now. What about housing and how the city has handled housing? Has that changed at all? Is it different? Enough? I think there's less of a, a move for affordable housing. I mean, in actuality, the, you know, anytime there's a big project, they do tout that some of this is going to be affordable. But the market, if you looked at like the H Street Corridor, New York Avenue, Florida Avenue, all of those areas, and now um, you're even getting out farther, like Nanny Helen Burroughs and things like that, there's mm -hmm. some more, some, a new wave of housing going up. But in terms of having, having it be affordable, that, that's the challenge. And I think that's been one of the hangups with Barry Farms with our redoing that is that they weren't able to find units large enough for families, placing a lot of families in those units. So there's a dearth of, of affordable housing. Perhaps there'll be a second wave where a lot of the condos start to get rented out. And you get that that uh, secondary market that opens it up a little bit. It makes it a little more accessible. But, you know, a lot of the townhouses and, and row houses in D.C. that used to be broken up into apartments, you know, you'd get two apartments. Now it's just one one row house that sells for close to, not close to a million anymore, but really up there. So I think that's happened. Some being built, affordable, like I said, and most of it seems to be coming out this way. And there's been an effort to distribute it evenly throughout the eight wards. But it's a little harder to find maybe in wards one and three. But we're told it's there. So mm -hmm. the, ho the housing market's a lot. I think it's harder now. It's harder really to find something affordable. And if you don't qualify, I'm, I'm a lot of the affordable is Section 8 only. So if you're in that area where you maybe you don't you make too much to qualify for that, but not enough to really, you know, go at the market rate, the going rate for things, uh, it could be a challenge. And you see a lot of people move into the suburbs, especially Prince George's County, uh, because of that. We're both from D.C. I know me personally, the rapid change in the landscape. So I remember 8th Street, 8th Street used to be like little mom and pop shops, townhome-esque homes, you know, and all of a sudden there's a 
12 story building. They're multiple. It's, it's totally changed. And I don't know for you, but for me, it's extremely uneasy because I turn a corner. I'm like, where am I? Like, I, I, <laughs> it's like, I don't recognize. So how do you, do you feel the same way or? Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, I can remember there was a time when at nine o'clock or eight thirty on a Sunday, eight street was, was barren. You know, there was uh maybe you had speeds bar and grill and Ohio restaurant farther up H going towards Bladensburg. And they were like the night spots. They were always open, but all of the stores shut down and you didn't have, what we're seeing now is a lot of clubs and restaurants, a lot of bars and restaurants on, on A Street. You wonder how much of that, uh, obviously there's a market there, but there's a lot of turnover with those things. And you see fewer of the stores that I remember. We talked about the little grocery stores. The, uh, there was a fish market where Horace and Dickie's is across the street from there. I think it was across the street from there. The, uh, there was a uh, Gordon's Fish Market, which was an old school fish market with the fish on ice. You had stores, Jupiter and uh, Crestgy stores, and a drugstore. So it was, it was more like the, the essentials as, instead of, you know, part of the service industry. Not knocking that. I mean, that's obviously vibrant and it brings tax revenue and people and traffic into town, but it, it's taken on a different air now. So I'm almost like trying to be another U Street or, um, you know, Adams Morgan type area. You're right. It's, it's good for the economy, but at the same time, it's I don't recognize my city anymore. I don't know yeah. if you feel I mean, like there's still, there's a thriving community back a block or two off on either side. And you see a lot of change there, like Wiley Place and Linden Place, those little short streets uh, that were pretty much almost forgotten are now, you see them coming back and, you know, the house being built up and e-roofed a lot. And that's, that's one barometer of, of what's going on in terms of residencies. It's the alleys. But again, who can afford that and, and who's taking part in that? You need that income to, to, to fuel that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it, it's been coming for a while. I remember there was council member Sharon Ambrose, and this had to be back, this had to be in the 80s or 90s when things were first starting to change along that corridor. Uh, there was a press conference on Wiley Place, which was one little street notorious for, you know, for the bad old ladies and everything. And she stood out there and said, in the street, this is going to change as soon as we get critical mass over here. And everyone knew what that meant. It, 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 it's, it means a lot of things, economic, critical mass, social, you know, other kinds of critical mass too. And that was that that was sort of the bell that was ringing then, and that's why a lot of those properties either got bought or were sort of reclaimed by the owners. When you had after the riots, uh, a lot of people leave, but some of them didn't sell those properties. They held on to them, and they were rental properties. And as things improved, as uh, you know, other things happened, people started coming back. You know, the sons of the original owners or the children of those owners mm -hmm. are saying, you know, we've got the house on what is now Capitol Hill. Let's move there. You know, now it's safe. We don't just have to go and rent it. We can, we can actually live there now. It's a cool place to live. And when you get back up to Florida Avenue, you see it even more um, becoming like, an, like Old Town, D.C. I mean, it, 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 harken, it pays homage to some of the architecture and signage and things like that. But, you know, it, it's not the same. It's uh, a wave had to come and, and sort of cleanse it. And then it came back again. Do you think architecture is political? I think so. I thought about it when I looked at my school and the, some of the schools we talked about, uh, talking about, there was a time there were a lot of schools being built in the district. And I don't know if it was the going thing or the, 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 what was in vogue in terms of school architecture, but a lot of DC architecture had this, it looked like almost like, a, I call it oatmeal-y texture and color to it. It was corrugated. And I think we were told that was so you couldn't put graffiti on it. It was harder to paint on it if you had ridges like a corduroy type thing mm -hmm. uh, in the walls and these rough surfaces, which may have been, but it, it changed color soon and it just didn't look like, like people cared, you know, at least in my part of town. And, and you know, by then I was, I was in Ward 8 more, I mean Ward 7 more. And like Fletcher Johnson, when that school got built, it was massive. And, but when you looked at it and H.D. Woodson, the same thing, it was stunning. It was you know, compelling, but it, it still sent a brutalistic message, I think. And there's a lot of criticism about the building. And when you look at the new school, it's lower, lighter, and airier. You get more natural light in it. You see how, like, both Woodson 
and Fletcher were like uh, sick buildings because of ventilation and light and things. Yeah. And yeah. even the new Dunbar, that was like the first one that had been built in a long time. It was a big departure away from the, the other style of, of school architecture you saw in DC, which would be from going way back, like my elementary school, it was the, 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 the square school building with the, with the tower and the bell and the clock on it. You know, that re was uh, repeating itself all over town. So they moved to something else and they were talking about, you know, making it schools without walls. I mean, that was the, the concept that they even talked about at Fletcher Johnson, as I, as I remember. And that just sort of faded away, I think. But you did feel like, you know, the stuff that was going up in other parts of town didn't look like the stuff that was going up to the park. I mean, to the park. It seemed like, okay, this is cut rate or, uh, you know, lowest bidder <laughs> type stuff. We can, we can yeah. build this and how permanent is it meant to be? But I don't think enough was given. They were just saying, be happy you have a new school, not the aesthetics and, and on a psychological or sublime level, what that means when you walk into a building that looks a certain way and doesn't hold up well, you know. Mm. That's a good intake. I know that for Dunbar, uh, a black architect actually designed Dunbar mm -hmm. and it, you're right with the whole brutalist style during that era. That was the hammer pants, you know, of the day, you know, yeah. the yeah. fashion with all of the mirrors that we had. In your opinion, is there one that stood out that helped with the housing efforts? I, I always felt that, that the architecture here was somewhat experimental. During my career, a lot of star architects would come in and would press on their style, especially with the monuments and, you know, certain office buildings. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there was a political push or a mayor that pushed it or did all male, male, uh, mayors pushed it? Sorry. Yeah, I think we saw improvement under Bear. We saw, you know, you, you saw the, the public housing projects get new windows and, and paint jobs and things like that. There's always been issues, though, with, you know, what you're starting with was it was just Band-Aid fixes for, for buildings that really needed to be changed. But that's political dynamite, even if it's for the better. And I think there's a realization that, OK, we'll improve this, but, you know, it's going to disrupt lives. It's going to change things and everybody won't be able to come back. And I think that's why we saw the Barry administration sort of go toward maintaining. There may have been a couple new you know, new developments put up with a different style of architecture and, and some like Ridge Road and areas like that where they took some of the old stuff and made it, updated it a little bit. But you still had the market, which was squeamish about DC. And I think we really saw, uh, it was not until the Williams administration where there was a the confidence, at least financially. And that, that also meant the control board, which gave investors and, and lenders some confidence in the city. It's just like, essentially, somebody said they have adult supervision now. They always had it, but there was all those congressional things that, that sort of hobbled the city to begin with. But it really took off, I think, during Williams and somewhat, and then it, it's still, we're seeing it ramp up now. I think it's really accelerating, accelerating now. Okay, great. One last group of questions. What made you decide to become a journalist? This is my own personal question. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like to talk because you can see that <laughs> it, it's really and you know in in school they tell you this is the worst thing to say in an interview about what to answer that question it's like but it's because i like to write and so i mean i like to communicate and even when you're talking if you know if i don't write down as much as you so you're still writing it you know what you're going to say i just don't maybe you know don't have to or have time to put it on, on pen and paper but you try to get it from that way but it's it's the just, I want to tell stories. I want to tell the stories of this town uh, that I grew up in. I, I like doing things that can resonate with somebody. You know, if you can say something or write something somewhere and it, and it just gets someone's attention or whatever point you're trying to make gets off and they can say, hmm, uh, uh huh, or something like that. So it's the, the same reason people do music and other things, I guess, is to look for that, that resonance and stuff. It's, it's to tell a, sto a storyteller. Yeah, essentially, that's it. Yeah, I'm just a, a young unemployed griot or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm young with a griot. What, what, what made you get into, want to get into architecture? What? Oh, I grew up in Tower House, and I felt that no kid should live like that. So I thought that architecture would be the path for me to make a change. 
and I, I'm at a stalemate right now in my career. And I thought that maybe I should, I need to go deep as to why I'm in this field mm -hmm. um, and examine where I lived and how right. that shaped me to be the person I am. Yeah. And in talking to people like you, I'm learning a lot is about the past that, you know, I wasn't even born then and just learning about that past and right. how it, so is it repeating itself? Like that's my journey right now is like, yeah. is history repeating itself? So. Yeah, it, I think it, it's it, it, like these concentric circles and some of them are tighter than others. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the changing, like, I imagine this is what it was like when Georgetown, you know, was changing part of Georgetown because that was a predominantly African-American. It was a dirty little port town and that did a lot of the work down on the, the docks at the wharf and stuff that you also had, you know, more fluent people farther up the hill and stuff. It's always been that way. But there was a wave when Georgetown got to the way it is now. And a lot of people ended up, as a kid, I grew up with folks who had lived, like the, I had a neighbor who used to tell me she lived where, where the Watergate is. They tore, she had to move because they were building the Watergate. And so she lived in Southeast where, you know, part where I spent post of, part of my time. And I know of other families that have been in Georgetown since the old days and still, you know, still keep property over there. And if you look at the churches on Sunday, some of those congregations are still the traditional families. They, they've moved to the suburbs now, but it's like a whole wave of people that come in. It's like a, a link to old Georgetown at, at certain of those churches. And, you know, they've kept that tradition up. It, it's a, it got a rich heritage. You're seeing now, you're seeing the same thing on H Street, whether or not um, any of it remains or there's a difference there. That's, that seems to be the same thing happening to me. Uh, it seems to me to be the same thing happening again. Again, I can only read about and hear accounts of how Georgetown changed, but from what I've seen, it was sort of a similar process. I've always <laughs> admired architecture too, because I mean, it's the same thing with writing. I, one of my favorite words is like demiurge, where you get to play God. So you can kind of, you can say, this is what I want to build and I want people to react this way to it. You have to apply economics and, and all other kinds of things to it. But still, that's, that's kind of like where art, it's the art of engineering or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. No, you're the only one I know. So uh, that was my, you know, I had my three things that I wanted to do, you know, in high school. <laughs> and uh, architecture was one of them. Because my English teacher suggested it too. She said, but she was talking about the math. I was horrible in math. And she said, I got a sister that's good in math and she's having trouble. So, and I wanted to be an engineer. So she said, you sure you want to be an electrical engineer? Why don't you be a journalist? Now, nah, I don't want to be a journalist because this was the 80s and everything was engineering. And I was, my fantasy is I'd be living in Silicon Valley by now and retired driving a Lamborghini or something. But here I am. So. One short of a Lamborghini. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm beyond that stage now. I'm happy to be on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much Derek my pleasure thank you and keep in touch you know keep me posted as you're doing things and if you want to bounce stuff off of you know off of me an older native but that's fine I, I will definitely do that like I said keep in touch feel free anytime okay I will okay thank right. you thank you okay bye 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 hey listeners I have an exciting announcement I decided to launch a membership program for the show where you have a chance to support me and the show directly. I love creating the show, and it means the world to me that you all tune in to keep hearing me week after week. But it takes an immense amount of time and energy to produce. I want to keep the show going, and I want to invest in its growth. And I also want you to become a partner with me in this journey. That's why I'm excited to give you a chance to officially become a supporter of the show at glow.fm slash arch is poly a-r-c-h-i-s-p-o-l-l-y or by clicking the link in the show notes it's quick and easy it takes less than 30 seconds and just takes clicking a link in the show notes and using apple or google pay you don't have to create any new logins and you can contribute as much or as little as you like if this show is part of your day or week and you like what I'm doing, then visit glow.fm slash archespoly, all one word, and support me and the show in any way you can today. <laughs>